Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Meron Kalili, and we are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe. And this is another live debate with our coordinating team featuring subversive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. And today we're talking about the United Kingdom, or more specifically, the political chaos in the United Kingdom. Yes, Britain normally has a reputation as a pretty stable country, but it's now had three prime ministers in just two months. The middle one, Liz Truss, announced the biggest tax cuts in living memory and then reversed them, bringing the economy to the edge of economic collapse. She lasted 44 days. Her replacement, once again unelected, is a man of the people, just not many people. He's Rishi Sunak, a former hedge fund manager with a net worth twice that of King Charles, and now the richest ever occupant of number 10. But the political soap opera aside, regular Brits are going through a very tough time. They're contending with soaring food and energy prices, rising mortgages, and a growing pension crisis. More than one million more people in the UK are expected to be forced into poverty this winter, pushing deprivation levels to their highest for two decades. And on top of it all, their new government is now priming them for more austerity. With familiar talk of hard choices now making the rounds in establishment media. So what can British people and those around Europe expect from this latest unelected Tory government? What is the opposition Labour Party, which is leading in all polls for the next general election, offering? And what can UK voters that actually want policies that put people first vote for? To answer these questions and more, we have our panel, which includes our own Yanis Varoufakis and UK campaigner Julia Moore. And we have a special guest today, Marsha Jane Thompson, previously the head of campaigns for Jeremy Corbyn and now coordinator of the campaign Your NHS Needs You. And you out there, if you have anything you want to say, any questions, comments, thoughts, rants, concerns, just drop them in the YouTube chat. This is live and we'll put them to our panel. Let's kick off with Yanis. Over to you. Thank you, Madam. Hello, everyone. Hello, comrades. Just before we start, you just joined the live stream, um, a facetious but not utterly pertinent comment that I made. Uh, I said that you know the, the problem with my British friends, whether they are Tories or Corbynistas like my, myself, is that you know, you think that you're too exceptional. You think that either you're exceptional and fantastic, you know, that Britannia rules the waves and the airwaves and you know our psyche. Britain is so deeply fucked that it is exceptional in this opposite way. And my bad news for my friends in Britain is that, folks, you're neither. You're neither exceptionally brilliant nor exceptionally terrible. Um, you're somewhere in between, like the rest of us. You know, um, we are mundane, all of us. Here in Greece, in Germany, in France, we are in a stagnation crisis, a, a, cri a crisis of stagnating financialized capitalism. Uh, where the, the crisis that began in 2008 flares up one day in Greece, another day in Italy, another day in Britain, but it's the same crisis. We are all in the same ship. It's a terrible ship. It is leaking. Uh, it is um, taking in water. And the people below decks, the many, the poorer, the exploited, the precariat, the proletariat, are suffering deeply, not just in Britain, but everywhere else. Uh, but allow me to, oh, by the way, one small comment, Madam, as comrades, um, we need to take each other to task uh, and keep the debate lively. So let me challenge the very um, conventional account that you pre presented to begin with. This thing about unelected governments, come on. I really don't buy that. I mean, I do. Unless you want a presidential system, a parliamentary system is the best of all possible lots. And uh, yeah, that means that parliament will have the capacity to elect and re-elect prime ministers. The alternative to that is a system like that of the United States or France. And that is a terrible system. Uh, effectively, it's the manifestation of first past the post. Um, electing essentially 
um, a parliamentary, a parliamentary, electing an emperor. And so, you know, the fact that the Tory party have messed things up and they have given us three idiots, one after the other in quick succession in uh, 10 Downing Street, is not the fault of the electoral system. The fault of those people in the Labour Party who did their utmost to undermine Jeremy Corbyn so that the Brexiteers under uh, Johnson would win. And unfortunately, we have a situation now where the greatest usurper of British democracy, a certain Mr. Oh, Sir Keir Starmer, is going to become the greatest beneficiary of the chaos that he has helped um, seal with that idiotic campaign of his for a second referendum. But I'm digressing. So let's go back to what has gone down over the last few months um, since the pandemics ebbing. After 2008, when the City of London, Wall Street, the Frankfurt banks, the Paris banks went bankrupt, central banks and governments, under the leadership of Gordon Brown, let us not forget April 2009, Gordon Brown got all of them together, the G7 presidents, prime ministers, central bankers, and they practiced socialism for the financiers, socialism for the oligarchs. They printed, my estimation, about $18 trillion to give it to the bankers. That took the form of zero interest rates, what's called quantitative easing, targeted long-term refinancing options. These are all the technical terms for socialism for the bankers. And that created a deflationary period because there was austerity at the same time for the many. In Greece, in Britain, George Osborne, you know, Germany, everywhere, Italy. So the result was that there was a lot of money in the financial sector and no money in the pockets of people out there. Investment collapsed because who wants to produce stuff for a public that doesn't have any money? So the money who had the money outbid one another um, in the stock exchange, in, in the south of England, buying houses, works of art, Bitcoin, any kind of idiocy that was available they bought it with the money that was printed by the central banks. Uh, and then there was the lockdown. And the lockdown did two things which changed and the situation and, and shattered this bubble of financialization, of post-2008, 2009 financialization. The first thing that the pandemic did was it um, choked supply by stopping transport, sea transport, land transport, air transport, uh, by you know, disrupting the supply chains, suddenly aggregate supply of goods and services hmm, was choked. And at the same time, for the first time since 2009, some of the money that was printed by the central banks trickled down to the many first schemes and some support for those who would have otherwise died locked up in their flats and houses. So you have a combination. Supply goes down because of lockdown. Demand creeps up a little bit. Demand for the goods and services that the many could now spend the little furlough wages and social benefits that they got during the pandemic. When demand goes up and supply crashes, prices go up. So we had in the first inflationary bout 13 years after the crash of 2008. And that shattered this socialism for the bankers and austerity for everybody else, equilibrium. The United Kingdom is not exceptional in that. It, the situation that you face in the United Kingdom is exactly the same as the situation that we face in the European Union, in the Eurozone. Actually, it's worse than the Eurozone. I will say a few words about that in the United States and so on. What happened was that yeah, there must be some canary in a mine. Britain was the canary in the G7 mine. It could have been somebody else. It could have been Germany. It could have been the United States. This bond crisis, the crunch that created the uh, panic in the financial markets, in the guilt market, in the market for United Kingdom public debt, which led to the demise of Liz Truss, could have started anywhere. Hmm? The fundamentals of Britain were not worse than those of the rest of the financialized capitalist West. West. It just so happened that the UK did to the rest of the G7 
that which Greece had done to the rest of the Eurozone in 2010. It was, yeah, somebody, it was a dirty job <laughs> of bursting the bubble and somebody had to do it. The reason why it happened in the United Kingdom was because you had the demise of Boris Johnson. Now, remember, as Britain was getting out of the second lockdown, Rishi Sunak, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister of uh, Britain, uh, made noises, made austerian noises. He started talking about doing some austerity in order to arrest the buildup of debt. And Boris Johnson, who is a far better politician than Rishi Sunak, who has a sense of what the people out there want, not that he is going to give it to them, but he's more of an astute political um, antenna than uh, Rishi Sunak is, slapped Sunak down and said, no, you're not doing that. I want to be prime minister. I don't want an austerity averse UK public to turn against the Tories. But when Partygate and various other shenanigans brought uh, Johnson down, there was a question of who was going to succeed him. Sunak had the, the inner lane, the inside lane, and then Liz Truss decided that the way she's going to defeat Sunak was by appealing to some of Thatcher's legacy, eh, small parts of her legacy, and try to attack Sunak from the right, from the libertarian right, talking about huge tax cuts, especially for the rich. You cannot lose with the rank and file of the Tory party if you promise huge tax cuts for the rich, you know, because this is how this, you know, they're, they're a bunch of old um, regressives, reactionaries who are, who are voting for the leadership of the uh, of the Tory party. Um, amongst the MPs, she, didn't, she, she was not supported as much as Rishi Sunak was, but she won the popular vote, the vote within the Tory party, amongst those who have never heard of a bad war or uh, a tax cut for the rich that they didn't like. The Liz Truss tragedy, and the reason why she sparked off this uh, domino effect, was that she did something that the markets would, were not forgiving her for. The markets were in turmoil in the United States and to a lesser extent in Britain before her mini budget. She reversed the order of what the markets and the rich wanted. They wanted austerity first. And then tax cuts, which is what Thatcher had done. Thatcher had slapped down austerity. I remember I lived in, in Britain at the time, after April 1979. She destroyed the working class through austerity. And then once the fiscal situation of the UK state was stabilized, she redistributed income through tax cuts. Liz Truss reversed it. She proposed huge tax cuts, didn't say anything about austerity, hoping that, you know, by the time her um, prime ministership was safe, she would, in six months, seven months, eight months, she would you know, impose huge austerity. Because the markets were so unstable, hmm, um, she was punished. And now Rishi Sunak has come back to do that which he was trying to do when he was chancellor. chancellor. On behalf to do Mario Draghi, to do what Mario Draghi did in Italy, what the Troika did in Greece, uh, what Thatcher did after the 1981 budget in particular. But allow me to uh, finish by saying a few words about uh, we are a pan European democratic movement. Now, let's look at Germany. Okay, so my friends in Britain, you're not as stuffed as you think. Look at Germany. Half of Germans rent rather, rather, rather than own property. Uh, and they typically keep their savings in bank accounts. They have no financial assets. They don't own homes, they don't own shares. Uh, they've missed out, the middle class of Germany thus, have missed out uh, on the compensating wealth gains of the last decade from the socialism for the rich. And now they are being struck by inflation which increases their rents much faster than your housing costs in Britain increase, uh, while the savings that are in a simple savings account are being depleted faster than yours are 
due to inflation. Uh, if you look at the, 10, the bottom 10% of the German population, they're 8% worse off today than they were in 1995. And if you look at the top, the bottom 40% of the German population, they are stuck in the same place as they were in 1995. And now they're facing a commodity squeeze, electricity bills through the roof and so on. Um, because of the structure of the German political economy, I just explained why inflation is so much more toxic in Germany because of very few assets being owned by the average German. Um, inflation is much more of a problem. Now, let me remind you that when the European Central Bank was put together and the German state agreed to subject itself to the European Central Bank and to sub subjugate the German Central Bank, the Bundesbank, to the ECB, the, the contract, the implicit contract was that the ECB would work and act as the Bundesbank did. Let me tell you a back of the envelope calculation that I've done. If that were the case, we should have 7.5% interest rates in the Eurozone. That will destroy Italy. The Italian state will go bankrupt. Not just Italy, because there is a lot of um, focus on Italy. Let me give you some numbers, which I've just jotted down here. If you, like, if you look at the total debt, total debt, private and public, uh, in, in, of France, it's 351% of French national income. Three and a half times. French national income. In the case of Britain, it's only 2.7 times, 271. And it's 200 in Germany, okay? Um, and it's, um, the Italian total debt is a bit, about the le same level as the British one. So DiEM25 needs to focus on this crisis being the same crisis that began after 2008, it is the same in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Greece, and in the United Kingdom. We don't give a damn about Brexit. Uh, for us, the United Kingdom is part of Europe, not the European Union, but part of Europe. And we will have to campaign in the United Kingdom, in the European Union, everywhere, to save our NHSs from austerity, to save the precariat from austerity or to bolster their defenses against austerity. Same with the proletariat, same with women, minorities, who are always the first victims of austerity because austerity is back with a vengeance. Rishi Sunak was trying to introduce this under Boris Johnson. Now he has, he has his chance. And let me finish off in the way that I finished in an article in the New Statesman, which I think is coming came out today or is coming out tomorrow in paper form, in print form. Um, a, a small point, which I think confirms the DM25 line about the need for collective action across Europe and the UK. Do you know what Mario Draghi, who shut down the Greek banks and practiced austerity in Italy, Mario Monti, who was appointed by Angela Merkel to be prime minister in Italy in order to introduce the earlier spate of austerity. Lucas Papadimos, who became the Greek prime minister, technocratic prime minister in 2011 to usher in and to solidify the murderous, murderous, genuinely murderous austerity that we had then. And Rishi Sunak have. They all worked for Goldman Sachs. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Marsha Jane, Marsha Jane Thompson, the floor is yours. Great, thanks everyone. Um, and it's, I mean, you know, like it's a really depressing time politically in the UK. So, you know, I was hoping I'd come on to events like this and we can do about international solidarity as we get strength from each other in, in fighting back. But, you know, as Yanis said, we're fucked. So, um, <laughs> but I'm sure that uh, we will all um, take some inspiration from, from each other. And, and actually we are obviously still making a difference with um, the fantastic UNHS Did You campaign that, that I'll come on to. 
to. But just to kind of briefly um, the end of here, you know, we've obviously, uh, Mary and Anne have already mentioned, we've had a revolving door of prime ministers and, and cabinet members, I think for the, for the health secretary, we've had four now uh, in the 100 days or, or something ludicrous. Um, we have Rishi Sunak, uh, again, Meryn said twice as rich as the king, a nice former banker, billionaire, million pound houses in California, uh, as well as Yorkshire and London. And he's going to undoubtedly try and gloss over his, his record in government when he was the chancellor. You know, he was at the helm when the Tory chaos and incompetence reached its height and caused the, the cost of living crisis. And you can't really stress how bad the cost of living crisis is in, in some parts of, of the UK. We have um, in the northeast 39.4% uh, of our kids uh, hungry in, in complete food poverty in the sixth richest country in the world. You know, people don't see the faces behind those statistics, but that's virtually half of every class um, actually sitting there hungry through their through their lessons as a direct result of, you know, of Sunak's choices as chancellor. We have seven million people living in, in cold homes, thousands of excess winter deaths last year and this year millions more in fuel poverty because of their failures uh, to handle the, the, the fuel costs crisis. Um, and yeah, Boris Johnson famously said, you let the bodies pile high in COVID, but we're seeing many more bodies pile high now through the impact of their 12 years of austerity. And as Janice said, they're kind of the new austerity 2.0 that, that's coming soon. Yeah, we've had those 12 years of cuts left us with a housing crisis, a crisis in social care, a crisis in education. We're seeing bits of, of people fighting back now. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of workers saying enough is enough from barristers to, to bin workers, nurses, ambulance workers, posties, teachers, everyone sort of saying, you know, the, our pay is so low now. We there was always that sound bite even a year or, or two years ago people choosing between heating or eating and we are inundated with people that can't do either they they don't they can't afford to exist the food banks and and warm banks and, and we know sunak is just going to continue in that vein austerity 2.0 yes but also still making decisions to give tax cuts to the richest still making decisions on uh, lifting bankers bonuses and I know that you know part of the discussion tonight um, you know, to move us on to sort of the NHS is whether or not um, progressives should be calling for a general election, whether or not it's a bit of a distraction, whether or not we have a fancy, you know, that he is democratically elected by our parliamentary system um, and, and what, what should be done uh, about that. But from, a, from the NHS's point of view, regardless, we need a campaign to save the NHS. Now it's not going to last until the next general election, whenever that comes. It's not going to last for the next few months if we don't really kind of ramp up our campaigning around that. We've, we've seen decades of, of privatisation by self just destroying various bits of, of the NHS from the bed capacity to staffing to bits of it you know, completely siphoned off to, to different private companies from Centene and, and American health insurance companies coming here and just buying big chunks of it. Um, to the extent of in the last 10 years now we've given 100 billion from the NHS budget directly to profit making companies directly at the expense of, of the services that we've been provided just to take one kind of small recent example rather than bore everyone with stats but one one quite sort of specific one that came out uh, just this week is that Pfizer made from the UK two billion in profit from the vaccine so just the profit was, was two billion. That's you know, six times the amount that the pay rise for, for nurses would cost. That that money could revolutionise that what's left of, of the NHS already. And what we're seeing in the NHS in the main, but also in other in other areas of public services, is the function of the government not being to to govern, um, but the function of the government purely being to transfer public money into corporate hands as much as they can. That impact on the, the health of people in the UK, I've, I've mentioned the, the poverty stuff, but the, it's the preventable deaths in the NHS. You know, we are seeing thousands of deaths that could have been prevented that are now happening because of privatisation, with direct links to privatisation, whether or not that be because there's 12 ambulances waiting in queues outside the hospitals that can't get in, or from overcrowding, or from people dying on trolleys because the doctors hasn't got around to them yet because of the, the lack of doctors. We're seeing people that are not getting their diagnosis from, from breast cancer because it's all been outsourced in the diagnostics and there's, you know, 
various different scandals coming to light about documents being lost that, that's all being there's all a direct link to, to privatization and moved it moving it on um you know we have there's just obviously i could go into details for hours on the, the various different minutiae of, of problems in the nhs but i mean that's kind of really what brings me on to the the unhs lead you campaign and, and why kind of dm and, and other uk partners decided we needed to do this because obviously we're speaking to internationally but in the in the uk people don't know that this is what's going on in the nhs it's it's been done so underhandedly over over years or by stealth that people haven't realized the impact of that and they're starting to look at that you know i think um yeah post covid and the obscene amounts of profits that people saw being made by ppe while nurses were making wearing bin bags or from test and trace being such a monumental failure and taking billions people are kind of looking at it and saying we want to know where that money is going now there's a higher level of scrutiny of, of these type of things so we decided you we were going to try and speak to some um, celebrity voices to use their platform to get the message out there what's happening and you know this is the kind of last chance saloon if you like so we had um we've had a big comedy night with comedians that hopefully are internationally famous like Stephen Fry and uh, and Frankie Boyle and they lent their voices to the campaign told people to go and look at unhsneedyou.com and to get involved and to drill down into exactly what's happening we're, we're now about to embark on a project with uh, Russell Brand and he's again lending us his voice and his um his YouTube show uh to get not just our voices on there, but also people that have been impacted by privatisation and campaigners and doctors that have been involved with us. So yesterday we had Dr. Bob Gill on um, Russell's show talking specifically about the impact of the blood service um, and the plasma service in uh, in the NHS, which when Jeremy Hunt, who is the new shadow chancellor, who says he's going to you know, rescue us from the 12 year of Tory chaos, um, when he was the health secretary, he sold the national health blood service, the, the plasma service, to an American company called Bain for 240 million. And the American company sold it to a Chinese company. Um, and so in that, you know, now we have a crisis in our blood service and people can't have operations because there is enough plasma and, and that's leading to extra deaths. So you know, we, we need to really get that out there. But we also need to get out there that the National Health Service, as, as we know it, it's already been destroyed in England. It's already been broken up into 42 different pieces. Those 42 different pieces all have their own budget, their own little board that can make corrupt contracts to their own little private companies. And it, it's, you know, the kind of mass destruction of the, the National Health Service as as we can see it. So, um, you know, have check out Dr. Bob on um, on Russell's show yesterday, which is at Rusty Rockets. Um, and have a look at Yanis is hopefully coming on again in, in a couple of weeks to, to talk to us all about it as well, because it's obviously not just important for the UK. It's, it's the NHS has been held up as a beacon for um, for other countries for, for a while. And, and you know, we were talking uh, before about the impact after the, the financial crash on, on Greece's is doctors and 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 everything like that. And before anybody um, screams at me about about Labour, I've, I've not I've not tried, intentionally missing them out. Um, obviously, they did also uh, have a massive huge impact on the NHS the the legacy of, of PFI has led currently I think there's still 80 billion pounds to, to for NHS hospitals to to fix and, and that's historical but even now currently you know we, we see Labour spokespeople talking about public private partnership and talking about using the private sector to bring down the 7 million on the waiting list, um, which obviously doesn't work. The more private sector people you bring in to bring down the waiting list, they cherry pick the easy cases and take a load of money out of it. And actually the waiting lists get longer, it, definitely on an individual level, people with more serious cases wait a lot longer. So, um, you know, unless we sort of really kind of ramp up our campaign, which we're hoping that we are doing now with this, um, thing with Russell Brand and everything else we hope you check it out with which is at your NHS need you and get involved with us and hopefully we can stop the full Americanization of, of the NHS thank you Marcia Jane and well I can speak to that what you've seen I just came back from the UK and I saw a, a family member who's in an NHS uh, hospital and the state is horrifying it's absolutely horrifying uh, what I saw there and People don't deserve that. That's anyway. Um, Julia, Julia Moore. Thank you. 
Um, thank sure. you, Miran. Um, carrying for Marsha Jay. Yeah, or actually, if I can carry on for Miran. Yeah, uh, two very close friends, family members, uh, one mild heart attack, no ambulance even promised, was taken to hospital by her own family. And a dear friend who uh, had a bad fall at home, 11 and a half hours on the floor uh, because of the, uh, the lack of services in that particular area. So, you know, very much the NHS crisis, very much starting to impact on everybody. We, for, our, for our international listeners, uh, we've used the phrase of a postcode lottery for a long time. And Marsha Jane has just given the explanation the the collective NHS that was part of the social contract post-war begins to break down by stealth and the 2012 Act was the was the real push towards privatisation which is now effectively in, in play and Marsha Jane has covered that uh, exquisitely so I'm not going to specifically um, add anything more to, to that but sort of linking what Yanis and Marsha Jane have been talking about what it represents what it represents for us as a DM25 UK within this progressive movement it's going to be a laboratory whereas Brexit showed a a global structural uh, malaise of people being reduced to a, a, a technical topic down to a binary yes or no. Forensically, I think Yanis has, has used the phrase, it forensically showed the world um, how systems like referenda are, are anti theatrical to, to, to democracy because they break down technical topics into oversimplistic uh, yes or no. The NHS and the, the, and the, the work that Marsha Jane is doing on the campaign actually could be part of our active campaigning. Now, Dushan, we have a we have an exquisite campaign director. Uh, we're we're beginning to encourage to be a, a lot more campaign active. Now, in the UK, the NHS, of course, as we've just said, touches everybody. One could say you could argue that about everything: education, housing, and jobs creation. I know the UK team specifically are, are very passionate about jobs creation. Our medics on the UK team are saying if you don't have job security, you're going to have a, a poor, uh, you're going to have a poor health uh, life journey. In this case, it's all interrelated, and that's what is confusing. This is why people don't get active because they see a whole issue out there. They're overwhelmed by it, and our job is to break it down to say you can be active you can do things and I think the NHS as, as Marsha Jane is saying if we're if we work in conjunction the NHS campaign can actually be part of our our project of uh, asking people to do things that they can do locally because this is going to impact on them austerity is going to impact on 60 million people as it is across Europe but in in that respect what Yanis was saying is that you know we do have to get over our exceptionalism the UK is no different to any other country going under terrible stress uh, and we and we have to get over ourselves and do something about it so the NHS campaign tells us once again how we can act collectively to have that single focus of what it is we want organize ourselves and be able to achieve it now we have those good campaign templates for our climate uh, policies and the oligarchs uh, that Dushan is, is introducing. And of course, the oligarch campaign sits very nicely with the NHS campaign and certainly the UK team. And we would ask anybody specifically in the UK or across the world who has an interest in that, that they can keep an eye on the plans that we're going to have to, to marry those two. So within the context of the political system in the UK, um, the, uh, the malaise of uh, not acting because things are happening by stealth, which is, of course is a very subtle political uh, technique. As Yannis said, Boris was a very, very astute politician in knowing what people wanted to hear in the way that Thatcher uh, promoted the dream of privatisation because people wanted to hear that they would become better if they became part of a shareholding democracy. It's, it's you know, old wine in, in new bottles. So um, the, uh, the parliamentary system in the UK, on the whole, would work if 43 million people 
uh, shone a light now and then and asked questions and spoke to their MP and asked why they voted in the way that they did, for example. There are things that people can do. If you have only 20 minutes a week to do something, you can do something that just takes 20 minutes. If you've got longer time than that, you can work on other things. It's getting people into the mindset to say, unless we are active, this is what happens. Austerity is a political choice. I'm sure Yanis has said that over and over again, and it's a political ideology. You don't have to adopt austerity as a government, as a political ideology. It's a choice, and it's going to come back at us in huge, uh, with huge strength. And only 43 million people under the system, until we change the system, can do something about it. The issue about most countries is that you have an engaged group of people who are active, but they're not enough of the voting electorate to make a big impact. Now, we mustn't forget in the UK that the UK is made up of four countries and our colleagues in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, uh, would say, please represent us differently because our political systems are moving at a different pace. Scotland, uh, with the referendum of Brexit voting to remain, uh, are aligning, aligning more with the other three nations. Wales has recently introduced an amazing project on universal basic income for the most vulnerable groups of young people in, in their communities. The devolved assemblies um, are finding their feet and we should represent that to the world. The world at the moment has ju just looked at the recent prime ministerial pantomime that's been going on. And I would urge people to also look at the three other nations because there is positivity and there is hope there as Marsha Jane has pointed out. So I hope that gives a sort of a more global picture and where that NHS campaign can sit within a maybe a revival of collectivism and maybe structural political change within the UK. Thanks, Julia. Perhaps I could ask you, um, for people outside the UK who are not that familiar with, with British politics, what is the position of the Labour Party on all this? Is, is it a, a, I mean, there will be a general election in 2024, if I'm not wrong. What exactly would people be voting for with a vote for the other? establishment party in the UK? Well, I'd really be interested. Marsha Jane's had a bit more active campaigning link with the Labour Party, so I'd really be interested to hear what she says to follow me. But my take on it is that unless the Labour Party, there was a very good article I was reading a couple of days ago, unless the Labour Party finds its focus and where that comes from, whether it's the NEC, whether it's the national, their national executive, the, the equivalent of the 1922 committee in the Labour Party, whether it comes from there, whether it comes from a new campaigning issue that he's saying stronger leadership, uh, uni more unified focus. Um, the phrase that's often been used is convergence politics still says the same. It's it's a continua. It's a continu it's a convergence of what is what it goes on and the excuse of carrying on for example austerity uh, politics which involves more retraction of the public uh, services from 2010 over 70 billion pounds worth of public sector money withdrawn from local authorities where the services are delivered now if the labor party cannot embrace that and say that is our single focus which would have immense popularity in the uk then they are just going to become a repeat of the coalition where they blend in a tony blair like continuation of what's happening at the moment so this is a turning my belief is that this is a pivot point for the labor party it has now a unique set of opportunities to say embrace the strikes embrace industrial action support those sectors who despite privatization despite the retraction of the public services into private ownership we are seeing a resurgence of industrial action. The Labour Party should embrace that when we're, they're very silent on that. They could do that. They could have a single issue about reviving public services, getting, uh, getting more money from the centre into local authorities and accounting for uh, private contractors, as Marsha Jane has alluded to. There's a lot of shady, bad practice. Sheffield blew the lid on that uh, about contracts being given without due diligence. So what we're, what we're talking about here is a, a latent 
poor system that is lacking trust that we're asking to be at the forefront of the future. So the Labour Party could almost pick its projects and say, we can't do everything before the next election, but we'll pick that one and we will be the party of that message. And I think they, they've got the unique opportunity to do it. They don't look like they're that party at the moment. That is a personal okay. review, and I must say, not a DM25 policy review. That is just a Julia UK citizen uh, view. Thank you, Julia. Marsha Jane, um, just briefly, would you agree with Julia's assessment? You've got yeah, some experience I mean, with the Labour Party, Labour Party yourself. <laughs> Tell us yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, the, the you know, the Labour Party could just always win the election on the NHS if it, if it promised to do it properly. Um, and we are seeing some good things uh, from um, from a straighting and, and Keir Starmer talking about the NHS, talking about really attacking the Tories for what they've done in the last few years, but talking about long term workforce strategy. The Conservative Party have promised a workforce strategy now, I think, for seven years or something like that in a row, and have just last month kicked it into the, the long grass again. Obviously, we have 138,000 uh, vacant positions in the NHS, which is adding to it being run down. Um, but as I said, they are also still leaning into, we'll use spare private sector capacity to shore up the NHS, which actually has has the reverse um, option. He's but they, you know, they are they're doing some good things. They're talking about mass recruitment in mental health professionals, mass recruitment in in nursing, and, and bringing back bursaries. So um, there are there's a lot more that they could be saying and doing. But it's um, you know obviously the kind of main line from from West Street and Keir is to Labour created the NHS, Labour fixed it the last time they were in power, and they'll fix it again this time. Well, you know, we we just sort of have to look at my new share of that as with everything, I guess. Okay, thank you, Marsha Jane. Some comments from the chat. Nationalize everything, says John Baxter. Um, Fox JC says, Keir is sacking people for going on picket lines. Uh, Blind Stagehand notes that perhaps a more controversial proposal for the NHS. A and E are the only parts of the NHS that should be under national control. The rest should be private, where uh, wherein you sponsor the individual, not the industry. And, and there's quite a discussion raging also about the media uh, in the UK, including The Guardian, but um, maybe we'll tackle that one later. Johannes, Johannes Fair from Germany, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring the attention a little bit to Germany that uh, Janis has uh, mentioned earlier already in the current state. And also here, <clears throat> I can very relate very much uh, in terms of our health system. Uh, going uh, down the drain over the last years because uh, the number of uh, hospital has been decreasing. The care workers in this country are really at the end of what they can um, do at work. They're protesting, they're trying something, but um, politics is, uh, or the current uh, uh, people in charge in politics are not listening. Um, and we had uh, all of that, of course, uh, uh, caused by neoliberal reforms of the past. Um, we had something that is called in German die Fallpauschale, something that is um, yeah, a fixed amount that you get, the doctor gets for every treatment he does, which really sends a really wrong um, yeah, um, incentives. So the doctor tries to have as many patients as possible, do it as quick as possible. Um, Certain operations are done too much um, because there's a certain amount of money per operation and so, so on and so forth. So everything um, was trying to be economized and be efficient. And that's actually yeah, not incentivizing what the health system actually should be about, which is the health of people. Um, and even our current social democratic um, uh, health minister, who Mr. Lauterbach, who has um, been part of these um, implementations over the last decades, um, admitted that maybe this kind of fixed <laughs> amount of money um, for every operation is not the best system. Um, but of course, um, saying something and then changing it is, <laughs> are two different things and there is no sign of that, unfortunately. Um, one reason why all of that is happening in Germany specifically um, cutting costs and privatizing things, for example, in the health system, 
is that um, we have a debt break in our constitution. So the state is only allowed to do a certain amount of debt to um, invest a certain amount of money um, and which is really limiting financing possibilities, for example, for a decent health system, a good health system for everyone, for the population. And that's why I wanted to bring everyone's attention, especially to the ones out there who are actually in Germany or speak German, um, <clears throat> to our campaign that we launched this week uh, as DiEM25 in Germany, along with the beautiful um, NHS, Save the NHS campaign in UK. In Germany, we have launched the Stop the Debt Break campaign, a DiEM25 campaign that uh, calls to stop this debt break, at least for last year, but in general, we are also working uh, to, um, to abolish it. So um, if you are interested in helping, there, there's a website called stoppt-d-schuldenbremse.jetzt. Sorry for the German. Um, so you can go there, do the five steps, and help, uh, help to stop the debt break in Germany. Thanks. Thanks, Johannes. And uh, uh, you can just go to dm25.org. I'm sure there'll be a link on our front page very soon in case you didn't get the the long URL that Johannes was just um, giving us. Amir, Amir Kiyai, our policy coordinator. Amir. Um, hi, and thanks, Mehran. I just wanted to quickly jump on a point that Julia was talking about and the question around what would we potentially expect from uh, the Labour Party come 2024, if not sooner, if the elections aren't held any sooner. Um, we have to like maybe sort of try to see this question since um, the former director of the public prosecutions, Keir Starmer, uh, took over the leadership of the Labour Party. Uh, besides losing 200,000 members since 22, 2020, sorry, um, the Labour Party has been transformed into a virtual business lobby. And besides, and we also saw this in the chat uh, being commented on, besides forcing his MPs to abstain from voting on giving immunity to British troops overseas and charming as many business leaders as possible, he's also keeping up his appearances on the football stadiums. And I'm just trying to highlight a point here around if you like the impunity that's that's going on with the office of the official opposition of the United Kingdom. So on International Worker Day, Workers Day of all days, um, he enjoyed the match between West Ham and Arsenal, sponsored by uh, a company, Practico. And so in the middle of a war in Europe, cost of living crisis, and so on and so on, um, he's finding time, he found time to attend another 10 games uh, football matches this year, all sponsored. Um, and we can also imagine with the upcoming World Cup, uh, you know, where His Majesty's most loyal opposition, his attention is going to be. It's definitely not going to be on the pledges he made uh, two years ago uh, during the campaign to take over the leadership of the party. Those 10 promises, it's all gone down the drain. Um, as as he's now came out and said, because the financial situation has changed, of course, that's the uh, I mean, one of the pledges was to be an effective opposition to the Tory party. It's got nothing to do with the finances. He's also come out uh, just recently with the new pledges on uh, the public British energy service to backing creative artists to the hilt. He's essentially making promises to everyone and everything. And that also, uh, you know, just one last quick point is we, we saw already with the very first pledge that he will definitely, of course, keep is the set fast support for NATO. We saw when he visited Brussels um, ten days, uh, two weeks before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which will further uh, plunge the United Kingdom into a new Cold War. So this is so we can see from the directionality that there's going to be very little sunlight between the Conservatives and the Labour come 2024. Thank you, Amir. Um, a couple of comments uh, related, actually, on on the chat. Just get them in front of me. Jens Olsen says, never vote for a party that excludes some people. A workers' party, farmers' party, fishermen's party will never make things better for all. Michael Kennedy notes that the UK needs a wider proliferation of political parties in order to, um, to serve the electorate. Okay, related. Um, Soren Heidegger says that healthcare, education, 
and culture can't be run like businesses or they'll become corrupt. Johanna Freeburn on the on unions says the unions need to separate themselves from Labour. The Labour Party component of union dues should go to a workers' party. Starmer couldn't even bring himself to verbally support striking workers. And a last comment on Starmer from Tommy David. No one with the title Sir should ever lead the Labour Party. Eric, Eric Edmund, our political director, floor is yours. I, we don't hear you, Eric. I think you're muted, perhaps. There we are. That yep. should do it. Now, I was just saying it's impossible to follow that. That basically summarized what I wanted to say far better than I could ever say it. Um, also, Amir touched on quite a few of the things I wanted to, 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 to bring up. First of all, I slightly disagree here with Yanis about having the parliament on three separate occasions, or two, two, depending on how you count it, but let's say three separate occasions choosing the prime minister of the UK within the same mandate, a mandate that started in, I think it was 2019, the UK was in a different place in 2019, and I feel especially in a country where the political system is first past the post and people vote as much as for the, who they want to represent them as for who they don't want to represent them. So it's very much a system where people do not feel particularly represented politically uh, overall um, to then uh, separate the, the, the electorate even further through these procedures, not once, not twice, but three times. I think a more a government that had the citizens' interests closer to heart and was more concerned about maintaining political um, legitimacy in the eyes of the public should have called a general election by now. And I think the reason that they haven't done it is exactly because they do want to discredit this entire process. They want people to be pissed off. They want people to be disheartened and disillusioned by the political process because they've got their core voters. They've got the people who will get them into parliament year after year. So they don't need more people to be inspired by the democratic system in the UK. So this is all entirely, uh, this all entirely plays in the hands of, of, of the Conservatives. Um, so I know that Yanis is not saying that what they did was right. I, I, he's just pointing out that this is the process in the UK and that process is legitimate. What I would like to say is that entire process is nonsense. The, the political system in the UK is completely unrepresentative. For years, it's been used as an argument that, you know, first past the post leads to stable governments. What? <laughs> Look at the last three, four years. You know, no. Oh, thank God there hasn't been a coalition government. Imagine the tragedy. Um, Look at the state of the country. It's nothing to do with first past the post or, or represent, uh, representational um, um, electoral processes. It's all to do with maintaining power. Um, and the problem we have in the UK is that there is this culture of let's not rock the boat. We are a stable country. Let's keep it stable and the rest of it, which is day by day being undermined by, well, reality. Um, and on the other hand, you've got uh, people who are so disillusioned by the entire process and they're so fed up by a system that doesn't lead to alternatives that, that they simply don't engage anymore. Um, and, and I think really, and if we're going to talk about anything in the UK, if the UK is ever going to get itself out of this mess, it's not by tweaking the current system, but talking about how to overhaul it. And you can only overhaul it if you can get um, people behind such an overhaul. You need to have the political appetite in, in society in the UK, and currently it's not there. People are pissed off, but that anger is not being directed uh, where it's due. And, and having this discussion about whether Keir Starmer, I mean, it's not even about Keir Starmer. Jeremy Corbyn was the head of the Labour Party a few years ago, and he was assassinated by his own party. He was kicked out. He, he was undermined because these political parties are so stable and are so dependent on that stability. The reason they exist is to maintain the current political system in the UK. Um, that is their, their entire political and, and power foundation. So you can't expect radical change from the mainstream political actors of the United Kingdom. It's, 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 it's a fool's errand. Um, so you, right now you've got this incredible social 
momentum in the UK. You've got the 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 the, the rail workers strikes. You've got the um, the Royal Mail strikes. You 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 have the discussion about NHS strikes. Um, there's the growing radicality of the green movement in the United Kingdom, much more radical in other places than in other places in Europe. Who's going to use that political capital in the UK? Keir Starmer. <laughs> Sir Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, it's all going to go down the toilet and people are going to get even more frustrated and they're going to lead it to further extremes. So honestly, I think that if, if one is to have an honest political discussion about the United Kingdom, um, then we really, and, and I know it feels like the world is burning right now, we need to do something tomorrow, we need a solution that can be applied tomorrow. But I think there is no solution that could be applied tomorrow in the UK because we'll, the system is so deeply rooted in the current establishment um, that no honest political change can happen through uh, the current infrastructure. So any democracy in Europe movement worth its salt should really be talking about uh, about these kind of deeper changes that need to happen in the UK and start building that appetite in society um, and, and move away from this discussion about Labour and Conservatives, because essentially they're both serving the same kind of political and economic interests. Thank you, Eric. Daphne, Daphne Dalcara. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to just piggyback a little bit on what Eric was saying. Um, one thing that would really worry me is that, okay, yes, like the first post past the post system is causing a lot of dysfunction, but I think there is, we're at this point where like the establishment is almost like displaying its power like slapping their face like slapping people's face with it like look at italy what happened like there was the anti-establishment parties that tried to break through they got integrated tried to break through because their parliamentary system allows it then they got integrated and now uh, as we talked on the italy stream it doesn't matter as long as you pledge the, against draghi government even whatever your politics might be, you were the anti-establishment and that brought us uh, the latest Italian government. And I think Sunak was the establishment desire from the beginning. And, and the, like Boris Johnson dropping out and like the establishment want, got what he wanted. And I think anti-austerity is important right now, very important. And I think Liz Truss knew this, that's why she, couldn't lead with uh, that. So she had to ridiculously choose first the tax cuts uh, as uh, uh, I don't remember who did this criticism, Yanis, I think. Uh, so, I mean, I'm very worried, like looking from what happened to Italy and now Sunak will on this horrible atmosphere where like the anti-establishment left has been destroyed in the Labour Party. The anti-establishment right has been put down in the Conservative Party. And I'm very, uh, and now austerity is coming, I'm very concerned about the reaction that's going to breed. Uh, it's very scary in my opinion. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Daphne. Yanis, let's bring you back in. Eric, the problem is not parla parliamentarianism. Uh, you know, Parliament should have the right uh, to appoint any prime minister they want time and again. Uh, formally speaking, because the only alternative to that is presidential democracies, republics, and those are far worse, far, far worse. Uh, the problem with the UK, the reason why you have unrepresentative government is not because the parliamentary group of the majority party can do, can, you know, can select whomever they want as the prime minister. The problem is first past the post. Because if you had PR, no, there would be there would be no Tory government ever to begin with, <laughs> ever. Uh, the tragedy of leaders of Labour, the Labour Party, and that includes uh, our great friend Jeremy. Um, I remember pressurizing Jeremy and saying to him, "Look, you've got to introduce, you've got to adopt PR. It's ridiculous that the Labour Party is not proposing PR." And between us now, nobody's listening, right? <laughs> It's not as if we're live streaming. Um, I, I, I know exactly why Jeremy didn't do it. It's not because he disagreed with PR. I know Jeremy agrees with PR. I'll tell you why. 
because he was facing a hostile um, parliamentary Labour Party. He was in a minority of 10 out of all the <laughs> members of parliament that had been elected under Labour. It was, you know, Jeremy, John, uh, <laughs> and another eight people, right? Facing the Blairites in the, in the party. And he knew that the moment he adopted proportional representation as the official party policy, they would lambast him as a defeatist who does not believe even himself that he can win using first past the post, right? So, and the result is that we are all caught up in this conundrum of um, first past the post being supported by the two major parties. So, but the problem is that. Uh, that's the one point I wanted to make. The second point is this. Keir Starmer proved his colors, showed his colors, when he was um, heading the Crown Prosecution Service. I remember vividly in 2011, when he was director of public prosecutions, the glee and the ease with, with which he prosecuted teenagers, young people who had participated in the Tottenham riots during the aftermath of the great crash of the city of London. He never prosecuted a banker, but he prosecuted to the end of the world and back youngsters who had participated in petty theft. Uh, anybody with that, that background, I don't care whether he's a sir or not, but you know what I mean. Um, the way in which he systematically was the Trojan horse of the Blairites under Jeremy's leadership. Uh, you could tell that he, he was there, the fifth columnist within the shadow cabinet. Um, he was cleverer than Yvette Cooper and the rest in the sense that he declared his loyalty to, to the leader, to Jeremy Corbyn, and to the Democrats. Democ democratic forces within the Labour Party, but he planted several landmines, one of which was the idiotic idea of a second referendum, greatly disrespecting the idea of democracy. We had a referendum, we fought in favour of Remain, and we lost. And, and Edgir Starmer, you know, just drove this through, and that was driving a stake in the heart of the leadership of the Labour Party at the time, and effectively handing over the victory. Um, to uh, Boris Johnson, in the same way that in 2017 they tried to do the same thing by through a, a number of coup d'etats within the Labour Party to unseat uh, Jeremy Corbyn, hoping that they would lose the 2017 election to get rid of him. Look, it's really very simple. I experienced that in government in 2015 here in Greece. The establishment does not need a program. They don't need a prime minister. Imagine that, you know, Rishi Sunak and his many uh, um, colleagues in the cabinet were all going to go on holiday for two years and do nothing. Yeah, just just let's, let's say that we, we put them in hibernation for two years. Nothing would change. I mean, actually, it would be a good thing because they would not, would not introduce new evil policies. The same policies, would, you know, but the state would carry on. So the establishment, the status quo does not need a government. They have a government. They don't need elect an elected government. They don't need elected politicians to be in the ministers. It's only if you want a rupture with a status quo that you need a progressive policy agenda. Yeah? Uh, and the greatest impediment to the con construction of a progressive policy agenda and its implementation comes from within the ranks of the uh, the loyal opposition to the to the status quo. Uh, when I was uh, in the ministry for a short six months, I was there. I didn't mind clashing with uh, the Christian Democrats in Berlin. I didn't mind clashing with the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. I had it was a great great fun to be clashing against the right in my parliament. The worst pain was experienced during the moments when. I would be stabbed in the back by comrades. Comrades who were inside our government to ensure that our government would never do anything radical. Okay, and the only way of preventing that is to have proportional representation. Because let's face it, if we had PR, you know, our comrades in the Labour Party would form their own party. Like we did in Greece. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. And we're at the top of the hour. We've gone past it by five minutes, so we're going to have to close there. But thank you to the panel. It's been a great discussion on the UK. There's 
tons of questions we haven't got around to answering in the chat so thank you all to you out there for your questions uh, we can move the discussion to the youtube comments um, after this a couple of urls for you if you'd like to join dm25 it's dm25.org slash join and if you'd like to participate in the your nhs needs you campaign to stop the privatization of the nhs that our, our guest marcia jane is uh, coordinating uh, she's not coordinating the privatization she's coordinating the campaign <laughs> then please go to your nhs needs you dot and you'll find all the details you need there. Thank you again for joining us, and we will be back at the same time, same place. <laughs>